What's going on, everybody? This is the moment. This is it. So, as most of you know, what I have been doing for about the past month or so now is I've been running this show, and I do weekly shows every single week where I'm bringing on superstars. And this is called the Make Money and Have Fun Show. And there's only one reason that it's called that, because the people that I'm bringing on here, they're making money, and they're having so much fun. Because remember, here's what happens. I see so many people in the industry, and they're talking about one or the other. They're teaching us how to make money, or they're teaching us how to have a ton of fun. What I want to do is I want to change the game, and I want to bridge that gap between both your passion and your prosperity. And today, I'm super excited. I hope you're super excited too, because I know I am, because I have one of my favorite people of all time coming on today. Mr. Les Brown is going to be here. He's actually hanging out backstage waiting for us. He's got a big smile on his face, so I'm super excited. But I want to tell a quick story before I bring him out here. So this is like the craziest dream come true for me, because I remember six years ago, being 19 years old and looking up to all these people in my life and thinking that they're so far away and I can never achieve the level that they're at. I could never speak to them, know them, get to become friends with them. And Les Brown was one of those people that I always looked up to. I listened to him in my car, on my radio, on my computer, on YouTube. And I'm just so honored and thankful to have him here. If you don't know who Les Brown is, you got to stop living under a rock, but let me give a, a brief description on him. He's one of the world's most renowned motivational speakers. He's renowned around the world. He's spoken for Fortune 500 companies all across the planet. Uh, he's been on uh, for three decades. He's not only studied the science of achievement, but he's mastered it by interviewing hundreds of successful business leaders and collaborating with them in the boardroom, translating theory into bottom line results for his clients. Les Brown is committed to motivating and training today's generation to be achievers and leaders as he introduces new audiences every day to it's not over until you win, up thoughts for downtimes, and fight for your dream. So I'm super excited to bring him on here. Let's all welcome Mr. Les Brown. Get in here, Les. What's going on? <laughs> I'm doing better than good, better than most, sometimes even better. I love it. I love it. I'm, with you. Absolutely. I'm so I'm so excited. I'm so pumped up to have you here with me, Les. This is really just a, a dream come true. I'm, uh, I'm pumped up too because you know I call you Flash. You make <laughs> things happen and you make them happen fast. So I'm excited. Yeah. So let's get it on. Let's do it. <laughs> So Les, I start off this show, and you're going to love this. I start off this show with the exact same question for all of my guests, and you're welcome to answer this question any way you'd like. What is your story? My story is that I was born in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City in an abandoned building on a floor with a twin brother. And when we were six weeks of age, we became foster kids. I'm here because of two women. One gave me life. The other one gave me love. I always say when I'm on stage that God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And when I was in the fifth grade in Miami at Douglas Elementary School, I was identified as EMR, labeled Educable Mentally Retarded, and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade and fell again when I was in the eighth grade. Have no college training, but my junior year, I met an instructor very much like you, a personality similar to yours, positive and very confident. And he said, young man, go to bo before the room and work this problem out for me. And I said, sir, I can't do that. He said, why not? I'm not one of your students. He said, do it anyhow. I said, I can't, sir. The other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley's smart. He's DT. And he asked, what's DT? He's the dumb twin. Hmm. And they all laughed. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk. And he said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And that startled me. I come to know that how people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. My mother taught me, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you, but words can hurt it very deeply, and it can really skew the vision that you have of yourself. And so I took him on as, as my spiritual father, as a mentor. I wanted to be like him. 
and and the rest is history because he's a great communicator. He taught me how to communicate. He and a gentleman by the name of Mike Williams who wrote mm -hmm. a book called The Road to Your Best Stuff. And and he taught me the value of developing your mind. He said, you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. He quoted Earl Nightingale, all of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. <laughs> I love that. And love practice that. OQP, only quality people. Who you run with determines who you end up with. I so, love that. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that really, for me, that's been how I've been living my life. And, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, at 19 years old, I was kind of introduced to this world. And all I did was start leveling up my associations. And now here I am talking to Les Brown, uh, you know, virtually. So this is this is such a, a cool moment. What let me I want to bring up that virtual kind of reality that we're living in now. How how has that transition been for you going from speaking live on stages to connecting with people all around the world from the comfort of your own home? What's that been like for you? From the comfort and safety of my own home. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I don't have to worry about anybody sneezing on me and I'm running out of the room. <laughs> it's been great. When I came back from speaking in Abu Dhabi, I had a big smile on my face because when I speak outside of the country, I, I earn over $225,000 an hour. That and, smile on my face. <laughs> and the corona, yeah, and the coronavirus wiped that smile off my face. <laughs> but the good thing is, I'm doing three and four virtual presentations a day. Right. In Hong Kong, in South Africa, in the UK, and Alaska. And it's, I, I love it. You know, I have, I'm bilingual. I have squirrels on the right side of the house, so I speak squirrely. And one of the squirrels' name, I named him Tyrone. <laughs> Tyrone, I'm doing a program now. I'll talk to you later, okay? And so many times he wants to interrupt my Zoom calls. So I enjoy it, and I'm used to it. And I don't think I will ever get on a plane again. I don't know why I would want to get on there. Right. It's got to be especially long distance. And if it's short distance, I'd rather go in a motorhome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, so I man, love it, I love man. It. I have a good time. I can do several cities a day. And I can still move the audience and talk to them and create an experience to transform them individually and collectively. I can do my coaching one-on-one -on -one just like this. And sure. teaching people how to tell their story. It's, it's great. I love it. I think one of the one of the most fascinating things for me is when I came up with the idea for this show, originally I said, I want to build a studio. And then I said, wait a minute, how am I going to connect with people all across the planet if I'm building a studio and, and having them fly into me or whatever craziness? And so this affords us an opportunity to do something that normally we wouldn't be able to do. I mean, you and I are, are connected right now from, you know, basically opposite ends up and down of, of the country. Um, would you say that that virtual speaking engagements and, and that kind of stuff has increased your business or, or kept it about about the same? It has increased my business mm. tremendously. It has it's really has quadrupled my business. Wow. Because I can say, yes, I'm where if if I could if I had an, uh, an engagement that conflicted with me speaking in L.A. at the same time. On, on the same day and speaking in New York, I couldn't accept that. But right. now I tell them, just make an adjustment of one hour and I can do it. So I do three to four presentations a day. I'm reaching more people. Geography eliminates, I mean, the, the computer eliminates geography. Yeah. So this, this place where I am, I'm, I'm turning down business because of the fact that when I speak, I give it everything that I have. When I speak, I go through that green light that's looking at me. When I speak, my goal is to get the butter from the duck. <laughs> I love that. I love that. What What is your favorite part of speaking, Les? 
to see the transformation that takes place in people. Because when you are, even if you're doing a broadcast like we're doing right now, and you can't see the audience, but you get feedback from them, things saying, I watched you today. And there are things that you said that resonated with me, that, that took the blinders off my eyes. I heard your voice. I believe that every voice has a frequency, and we all have a story that, that we can use strategically to distract, dispute, and inspire, to distract people from what psychologists call their self-explanatory style, to dismantle their current belief system and inspire them to make some new choices. So to me, when you can impact people's lives, when you can help people to get a larger vision of themselves beyond their circumstances and mental conditioning and the the things that they're dealing with, that is very rewarding. I believe that we are here to help each other. We're here to help each other to get a larger vision of ourselves and to live a life that will outlive us. Amazing, amazing. Do you, I, I always, I'm always curious about people like yourself. Would you say that there was like a, I like to call it a catalyst moment or a turning point in your life where you realize that, that you want to inspire and motivate others and, and be a speaker and, and kind of everything flipped for you at that, at that moment. That moment when Mr. Wash, what he said to me, someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Denzel Washington did a movie and it's called Touch. And he said, there are moments in life that appear to be slow motion. There's before this and there's after this. And after this, nothing is ever the same again. And so when he spoke to me and the relationship that I developed with him and watching him transform students, I was never one of his students because I was never mainstream. And so watching him coach students and, and seeing how they showed up differently, how they dressed differently, how they express themselves. I was impressed with that. And I followed him. I, I learned a long time ago, if you want to be successful, uh, be around people that you want to be like, that you can learn from, that you can grow from. Uh, one of the most important things that people can do now is develop relationship capital. Our relationship is, is the result of that. And it's a seesaw relationship. I believe that you're never too old to learn. And you're never too young to teach. So there are things that I'm going to learn from you, and there are things you're going to learn from me. And I'm always learning. Even at 75, my goal is, is to finish strong. So <laughs> I haven't done my best stuff yet. I hear your footsteps, so you better pick up the pace. I love it. I love it. <laughs> And so, Les, I, I have a couple more questions that I want to ask you, but we also have over 20 people on here that are uh, jumping in in the comments and stuff like that. So I want to give some other people the chance to ask you questions as well. And if you're watching, the easiest way to ask Les a question is to put it in the comments. But if you want, you can actually come backstage with, uh, with Tamisa, who's already back here. And if you... Text in the word less to this phone number right here, 215-596-1515. I can actually bring you on camera backstage with Les Brown to ask him a question. But the you easy gotta teach me how to do this. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's what I'm here for, Les. The easiest way to ask your question is to type it in. It's more likely to get answered that way. But if you want to come backstage, text in less. I'm not going to be able to get to everybody just because of time constraints, but we can get you all in here. So ask your questions for us. Let us know and give us some thumbs up. Give us some likes. Give us some hearts. This is awesome stuff. Now, Les, I want to talk about what we're doing. So we've been training together for, I guess, about the past month, month and a half now so far. And it seems like you're doing a bit of a transition. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you're looking to educate and grow new speakers, younger speakers, people who are just up and coming and kind of create little models of you now. Is that kind of more more of your focus today? or Yeah. You know, my very good friend, Manny Lopez, he, he, he's there listening at the audience. Manny mm -hmm. and I are very close. Yes, you learn, you earn, you pass it on. And and the key to, to me, uh, learning to step out of line 
and and focus on building a legacy. That's what it's about for me, building a legacy. And I could have, I wished I could have gotten and done an interview with Zig Ziglar like you're doing with me or Dr. Norman Vincent Peale or yeah. Jim Rowan. We talked backstage when I was opening for them, but never a conversation just like you and I having right now. I never did that with any of the Giants and, and none of them never would have considered endorsing me because they saw me as competition, except for Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. He did make a positive statement about me. He said, Les Brown has a rare gift. And he was the first speaker and only speaker to say that because he saw me speak and he, he loved one of my quotes, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. And he ended his career. That's the last statement he made when he made a public presentation. And I was honored that he used my quote at that on that PBS special. It's, yeah, it's, it's exciting to see the new speakers like yourself. And you're doing the right thing. Having this program every day, speakers speak. And you have, there's a rhythm to speaking, the creating special moments to learning the range of your voice and how to modulate it and how to create a committed listening and 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 stretching and challenging your voice so that people will pay attention. Attention is the new currency. Yes. How to get attention, how to create an experience to hold the attention and how to ignite, to release the attention so that people begin to make new choices about themselves. So... You're doing the right thing, interviewing people, getting information, but most importantly, challenging yourself to do this on a regular basis because this there's another voice in you that, that will emerge and that will come out. And my voice is, is not all the way there. I still, after 51 years, I, I still believe that there's more for me to do and more range in my voice. And I'm consciously and mindful of what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. I love that. I, I love that so much. The fact that someone like yourself can still adopt the mentality of a student, it means a lot. That That's always been a big thing for me. I started my speaking career technically as a martial arts instructor. And it was a weird phenomenon because it was like, I'm really good at this, but I don't know why. And, and it's just kind of grown since then. And, and like you said, everything is a moment to be a student and everybody everybody has that, that time to be a teacher as well. I forget how you say, you know, you're never too, too young to learn. You're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. See, you, you can't quote Les Brown. You just got to ask him to say it. <laughs> it. So we got a couple of questions coming in here from our audience members. So I actually have a couple old mentors. I want to ask uh, Jason's question. So Jason was actually probably my first mentor in the real estate investing space, but he said, hey, Les, what's something that you felt was a big disappointment when you first encountered it, but then later in retrospect found out that that failure was the biggest blessing later on in life? Ooh. Man, Jason, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked me that question. No one ever asked me that question, but it's been on my mind. When I had a nationally syndicated talk show, I was paid $5 million to do the show by King World. They wanted me to do a show that wasn't me. They wanted me to be the black Jerry Springer. And I said, that's not the kind of show I came here to do. Hmm. And they canceled the show. As I look back, I'm so glad that they did. At first, I thought it happened to me. But now as I look back, it happened for me because who I had to become and the adjustments I had to make in my mindset. And I had gotten off my path. The singer Gladys Knight and I, we were married at the time. And in a very short period of time, I went through a lot. Went through a divorce from someone that I love very much. My mother passed. My best friend passed, and I was diagnosed with fourth stage cancer you know, 27 years ago, and I'm still here. But when I look back, that was a blessing because 
that world was not my world. I, there's a line in the voice in the song, lift every voice and sing till have, until earth and heaven ring. And there's a line in there that says, let our feet stray from the place, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. I saw a picture of a young man who played Home Alone. Can't think of his name. And they asked, where, where are they now? And he's one of those subjects. When I saw him, I was startled about how life turned out for him. He's still here. He's got a chance to recover his life. Hmm. Boy, he looked real rough. And so some things happen to you and some things happen for you. And at the time you can't see it. Well, so when I get up in the morning, my prayer is all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. And so God stepped in and says, no, you stick to speaking. No, I don't want you doing this. I don't want you in that pool. No, you come over here and swim with me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Um, so Manny Lopez, who you actually mentioned, has, uh, has a question for you. So Manny asked, what is the most effective way you have been able to create opportunities as a speaker or a coach? The impact that you make. Mike Williams, who wrote the book, The Road to Your Best Stuff, he's my mentor to this day, The Road to Your Best Stuff. He said, Brownie, even though you don't have an infomercial like Tony Robbins, even though you don't have financial backers spending millions of dollars for you to be on television every hour, focus on changing lives. If you focus on changing lives, the impact of that will increase your repeat business and your referral business. According to studies by the National Speakers Association, the average speaker get around 25 requests a year. Hmm. I get over 3,000 a year. Wow. Because my focus has been not to speak to sell, but to remind people, you have something special. You have greatness in you. And to use stories. It was Steve Jobs. He said, the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world. To use stories to take them on, an, on a journey to create a significant emotional event so that people begin to get a larger vision of themselves beyond where they are now and see themselves already accomplishing and living their dream. All accomplishments happen twice. First in the mind and then in the without. Hmm. I love that. I love that. And I actually want to kind of move into a little bit more talking about the technical speaking aspect. Um, we have a couple people who actually ask questions about getting on stages and stuff like that. So Lori, Lori actually asked, uh, how can a new speaker find free and paid virtual speaking gigs now? Lori, one, determine what area are you looking to speak. You want to narrow that down. What, what, what is the, 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 the audience that you want to speak to, the one that you feel most competent and most confident to speak to? Once you determine that audience, then what you want to do is find people or associations where they gather online and, and, and create a presentation that's designed especially for them. When I wanted to get in the speaking business, living in Miami, I used to get the convention list of conventions coming to town. Then I would look at what their mission statement was, and I'll become familiar with their mission statement. I didn't just call them out of the blue. So I would call, let's say, a, a major financial company coming to town. Hi, my name is Les Brown. I understand you'll be coming to do a convention here in Miami. And I see that your mission statement is to help people during this time where the coronavirus is, how to stay connected even though you are apart. As you're aware, 
technology eliminates geography. And so what I do is create an experience with your team so that they are able to experience being connected, a sense of unity, and being on the same page and achieve the objective that you want, creating a great customer experience. But they are your internal customers. How you treat them will determine how you treat how they treat your external customers. So my goal and objective is to help you once I find out what it is you want. I've, I've, I've learned, sir, that I don't come in with a canned speech. I, I believe that you never take away from your clients what they want to hear. Never let what you want to say what your clients versus what your client wants to hear. So I'm interested in knowing what is it you want that audience, your audience, to walk away with? What What are the five takeaways that, at the end of my presentation, because of that experience, Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, it could never be satisfied to going back to where it was. Let me know what those things you want them to have, and I will incorporate that in my presentation and make you look good and motivate and inspire them to pursue those goals and make their goals the goals that you have and their goals become one. Amazing. Amazing. So so it's more focused around speaking for the audience in a sense, as opposed to just pontificating at them. Yeah, it's when I came into the industry, it's governed by the Dale Carnegie course to this day. And it's a very good course. And they teach, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Right. I teach and I train speakers, as you're aware, never let what you want to say get in the way of what the audience needs to hear. Conduct communications intelligence. Find out their sweet spot. What's keeping them up at night? What's stressing them out? And what are the things they've tried? What are the things they've heard that did not work? What third party validation are you calling me in for that I will have more influence and empower to bring that perspective than you? I'm curious, Les. I, I had a question. I actually wrote this down. And I, and I think that that might have just been the answer to it. But I want to ask you anyway, would you say that, that that right there is what makes the difference between someone just being a speaker and becoming this world renowned authority like yourself in the in the speaking world? In 51 years, I've never given the same speech. Mm. As one. Number two, the, the majority of speakers have a memorized script. Right. I teach and train you how to speak to the heart out of the things that you've experienced, the things that you've gone through. Because the things that you've overcome, the things that you have experienced become the survival guide for someone who's struggling with that right now. And what you do is you custom design a presentation that will take them on a journey within themselves that they can never go by themselves. I love that. I love that. So let's kind of get into a little bit more of the the payment around speaking engagements, because I think that even people that are inspired by speaking, that's a little bit enticing to them. So Manny actually asked a great question about um, payment for speakers. And he asked, would you recommend speakers today focus on trying to get speaking fees or paid up front to speak, or rather focus on the back end follow ups? And which one of those do you feel gets better results? When I just started speaking, the money was at the microphone. Mm -hmm. That's no longer true. Mm -hmm. You can speak free and earn over 200, 300, a million dollars a year because of what's happening in terms of products on the back end, a selling of one day, a full day training or a weekend mastermind. So the money is at the back end. But I encourage people, don't speak to sell. Speak to create value for your audience. If you transform people's lives individually and collectively, 95% of speaking engagements come about because of personal recommendation. If you transform people's lives individually and collectively, if you can make them feel good, you can make them laugh, you can entertain them, you provide some content for them, they will recommend you to their members, to their friends, to 
people that's on their level and can sign that check. I love it. So yes, create the value first. That, that, that's amazing. And and that follows two sequences here on the show that, that I believe are really, really strongly evident here. One is, is the relationship currency, which we've been talking about basically since the beginning. And the other thing is understanding that money is really nothing more than just a byproduct of value creation. And when people understand that, doors open wide up for them. Without but, any question, yeah, you don't get paid by the hour. You get paid for the value you create in that hour. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have a couple people backstage with us, and I actually want to bring them on to see what they have to say to you, Les. So let's bring on Tamisa. Tamisa's been hanging out with us actually even before the show started. She got in here early, and uh, she's been waiting to come on. So let's bring Tamisa on. What's up, Tamisa? Hey, gra- glad to be here on this Spotlight Saturday. It's great. Hi. Hey, Les. Hello, Tamisa. It's so great to see you. Yes. It's always great to be in your presence, whether it's virtual or in person. You just inspire, motivate, and just get people excited. So kudos to you, and, and the world that gets to hear you is just blessed. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you. Tamisa, do you have a question for Les Brown? I do. I am. My motto in life is if it's not fun, I'm done. And um, it's always fun being around you, listening to you. And I love since COVID the new do that you have. It's just great. (laughs) And your laughter, I carry it with me always. It's just so infectious and contagious. And laughing is the best medicine. My question for you is, I know you have been in the presence of and have spoken to so many great folks. But if you had one person that you maybe were stuck in an elevator with that you've never had the opportunity to share a message or ask a question to, who would that be and what would you ask? Mm. Nelson Mandela. Cool. I would like to ask him, what gave you the mental resolve? Not to allow them to break you. You were isolated from your family for 26 years. All you had to say was that I believe that apartheid should be abolished and not use violence. And you wouldn't say that. You said, whatever it takes to be free, power concedes nothing without a demand. That's the Frederick Frederick Douglass quote. What made you just state a course? At any day, they could have killed you. You were in isolation from all the other inmates. They didn't want you to influence them. How did you do that? 26 years. And then come out, become the president of the country, and forgive your captors. Said, I forgive you. The people, the guys, the jailers. The people who robbed you of your time with your family and your wife and went through a divorce shortly thereafter. How did you maintain that level of compassion and, and, and humanity not to turn on them and punish them for what they did to you and the life that you could never reclaim again? That's who I would love to talk to. Fabulous question and fabulous person to be seeking that. That is that is great. So determination and fortitude is it. But you're right. Some things happen to us and some things happen for us. So thank you for all you do for all of us. And I'm so inspired. So have a great day. Have a great week. And thanks, Brad. See you later. Tamisa, thanks for being here. That was an awesome question. But I got to kick you out now. See you, Tamisa. <laughs> This is your time, baby. This is your time. You have presence and charisma that even Stevie Wonder can see. I love that. That was a a great question. I really like that question. So we actually have one other lady backstage. And this lady, this is Marisol. She, um, I need to, I need to be a little bit humble here, but she has been turning into a bit of a, a fan of my own stuff. So I'm super glad that she's back here and hanging out with us. So Marisol, what's going on? Hey, we, we can't hear you, Marisol. You might need to turn your microphone on. Unmute yourself. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? What's going on, Marisol? Do you have a question? I sure do. My question is, I would love to hear um, 
Mr. Brown's perspective or take on learned helplessness versus manipulative behavior? Hmm. Well, the learned helplessness that was written by Martin Seligman from the University of Minnesota, that people have been trained and learned how to become helpless. The other concept that you mentioned, I'm not familiar with that. But what Silliman said, which I think was backed up by psychocybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, that we become conditioned based upon our environment and our circumstances, that between the ages of zero and five, a word is formulated in our heart, and that word is yes, or that word is no. Hmm. And that we can reverse that. We can begin to restructure our thinking through going to seminars and workshops and through reading and through the relationships that we have and, and the goals that we have beyond our comfort zones. Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone that you've never been. And so... Hmm we can learn to be empowered. We can learn to restructure how we see ourselves, change our self image and begin to have major breakthroughs in every dimension of our lives. One of the things I, I love to do is quote Denzel in this movie called touch. We're taught to by Paul, forgetting those things, which are behind reaching forth unto those things, which are before we press toward the mark of a higher calling. Well, there's a line in a movie that I saw. Magnolia is the movie that Tom Cruise, and the mm -hmm. line was, woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. We might be through with our past, but our past is not through with us. Mm -hmm. when, some, when I see somebody doing something, I don't ask, why did they do it? I ask, what happened to them? that caused them to become this kind of person. I understood when my mother said to me when we were coming both the Venetian Causeway and there were signs that said, Jews, dogs, and colors not allowed. And I asked my mother, I said, why do they hate us? And she said, I don't know but don't you ever be like them. I saw this lady the other day. She said, I hate you. She was talking to some Black Lives Matter protesters. I hate you, and I'm going to teach my children to hate you. Mm. And I've always, since that time, on the bus with my mother sitting in the back, I always wonder, what happened to, to white people, those who the perpetrators and those who are the witnesses, mm. those who just watch, like the cops did, with one of their buddies had a knee on George Floyd's neck. How do you, how do you watch people be dehumanized, demeaned, and dismissed? This study came out, the Federal Reserve, and it said that a black college graduate who graduates with thousands of dollars of student debts, they compared the wealth of them and white college drop, no, white high school dropouts. The white high school dropouts creates three times more wealth than black college graduates who graduate with thousands of dollars of student loans because of systemic racism. Yeah. So that's why my, my new book is called You've Got to Be Hungry, The Greatness Within to Win. That the only way when you're a person of color, the only way that, mm -hmm. that you are going to get a fair shake, you've got to give it to yourself. Nobody's going to give it to you. You've got to fight for it. Frederick Douglass said, we won't get everything that we fight for, but everything we get, there will be a fight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's exactly what I needed to hear, too. Pump me up for the rest of the weekend. 
Thank <laughs> okay, you. Thank you, Marisol. Thank I'm you. Marisol, there's absolutely thank nothing you. you can do about it. <laughs> See you, Marisol. Thanks for coming on. That was great. I love it. I love it. So, Les, this this has been amazing. I want to start wrapping up with you, but I want to ask you something that's that's really important, and it's kind of about me, but I think that this is really a ubiquitous thing that a lot of people who are with us right now are feeling. So, as you know, you and I have been coaching together one on one for almost the past two months now, and basically, I have taken 2020 as my time. This is my time to stack my deck and to get everything in place so that come the beginning of 2021, I can basically throw my four aces on the table and release myself into the author, speaker, coach, consultant world. And as I'm sure you know, 51 years in this business, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. And some days you wake up and you're excited, you're motivated, you're pumped up and you're ready to go. And then the next day you wake up and you're like, what did I do? Why am I in this? So Les, what, what would be some some words of motivation, just some way of saying that it's possible. You you can do this. And, you know, do you think it's something that anybody can do and, and anybody can make happen? I encourage you to find something that's you. To become somebody's somebody. And what I mean by that that when Mr. Washington said to me, young man, somebody's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. He became somebody to me that influenced me that I wanted to be like. Become somebody's somebody. There's a guy who jumped off the San Francisco Bridge and, and he was one of the few that survived. And, and he said the moment that he let go, he knew he had made a mistake. And when he left home that morning, he said, if someone had made eye contact with him, if someone had spoken or smiled at him, he would not have attempted to take his life. And, and, and so to me, we are here. We are, we are caretakers for God. Life is God's gift to us. And how we live our lives is our gift to God. And that we're here to to live a life that will outlive us. Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. And so when we hold ourselves to a higher standard to, to, to see ourselves as servants, the greatest among you will be your servant. We can make a mark. We can build a legacy. We can live the, leave the world in better shape than how we found it. And I think that's what's in you. That's what drives you. You are called to do this. There are people who just see themselves working a job. A job is what you get paid for. A calling is what you are made for. And so when you're made for something, you don't need a vacation. This is Saturday. You said, I'm going to be doing a broadcast. A lot of people take off on Saturday. I said, give your passion and your dream and your calling over time. I'll, I'll end with this. Bob Marley, and you've heard the story, ended a concert and a reporter did an interview with him and asked him, why did you work today? I understand you were shot recently. You could have, you, you could have taken today off. You're Bob Marley. He said, people who spread evil in the world don't take a day off. Why should I? Wow. That's deep. This has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy and Fred's pride and joy. That's <laughs> my story, and I'm sticking to it. Any of your people would like to have some one-on-one -on -one coaching, have them reach out to me, lesbrown77 at gmail.com. Seven is my lucky number. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm actually going to put that on the screen so if any of you want to train with les brown the way that i am send him an email send this guy an email who thought if you thought this was good stuff let's get some thumbs up going get some hearts going on this was excellent tamise has given us thumbs up even in the backstage there she's given us double thumbs up i love it i love it les 
This was absolutely amazing. I it's love it. It's a pleasure. This. Thank you. Give your father my regards. He's raised greatness in you. I love that. I love that, Les. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. So, Les, until next time, thank you again. All See right. You. Bye for now. <laughs>